Well, the U.S. government is back open today, but lawmakers face a new, very tight deadline. President Trump signed a bill last night that funds the government until February 8th. It also reauthorizes the Children's Health Insurance Program for six years. Now, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said that he intended to take up immigration and DACA in February, but there are new questions over just how this shutdown affects the U.S. on the international stage. For more on this now, we want to bring in Alex Clement. He's a CBSN contributor and signal writer for G Zero Media, part of a new partnership between CBS News and G Zero Media, a Eurasia Group company. <laughs> it's a lot there. Um, so yeah, you know, we've been talking about this whole shutdown as a you know a domestic issue. You, but kind of like almost a bit of a speed bump. I mean, we had the weekend and then one real day of closure. And now the government's back open. I never even really considered what other countries were thinking as they were watching us. Sure. Well, first of all, it makes the U.S. look quite bad, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, people around the world look and they say, this is, the, this is the richest country in human history. Why can't they even fund their own government? Right. Right? I was down in Argentina last week and people were like, how, how is this possible, right, Argentina? Um, the second thing is that it makes democracy itself look not so attractive, right? People look at the dysfunction. They look at the polarization, they look at the squabbling, and they mm. say, maybe the system isn't so great. And actually, if you look at polling around the world in the past couple of years, people's, the, the, people's idea that authoritarianism is a better way to get things done, that's growing in a lot of countries, if that's you look terrifying. at polling. Um, and of course, you know, no country makes more hay out of this news than China, right? The state news was trumpeting this as an example of dysfunction, chronic problems in the U.S. system. And it comes at a time when the Chinese, of course, are advancing their own vision. The, <clears throat> their own system mm -hmm. uh, globally, and China's government is an authoritarian government that never shuts down, right? Ever, yeah. right? right. It's, you know, so uh, so I think it's 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 a real propaganda gift for China at a time when they're advancing their own uh, vision for the world. And the U.S. democracy doesn't look like it works so well. Uh, you know, I suspect that uh, it certainly, as far as the president is concerned, he's somebody who campaigned as the greatest deal maker in the history of the world, and that it reflects more poorly on his inability to mm -hmm. make a deal at least as far as uh, in, in this particular case is concerned. I, I thought it was interesting that the conservative writer Eric Erickson had this tweet, the fact that our government can shut down from time to time is actually a sign of our greatness. An actual authoritarian government would never shut down because the back and forth between parties and competing desires of voters would be ignored completely. Mm -hmm. I actually think that makes a lot of sense. It's true. Look, I mean, the reason that the government can shut down is because we have a presidential veto. We have filibusters. These are institutions of democracy that can keep, you know, these are checks and balances. I think the problem is when you have a situation that things are so polarized that those checks and balances actually become obstacles to action, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm certainly not here to tell you that authoritarianism is a better system sure. than democracy, and believe me. Uh, and authoritarian systems like China's will have their own problems when people get really upset with the system and the system can't absorb those different points of view and those different opinions. Uh, but for the time being, uh, we are so polarized in the United States right now, socially and politically, that these checks and balances act as obstacles to efficient action. Mm -hmm. And the Chinese love to point that out. They say, look, we are an energetic government that is getting things done, mobilizing trillions of dollars in foreign investment, getting all of our tech companies in, in, you know, in order to make China a tech superpower, all these right. things. And they can say, rightly or wrongly, look at the Americans, they can't even keep their government open. Mm. Right, a PR gift, really. Yeah. They can promise, they can make pledges and promises in regards to money. You know it's going right. to be there. Right. And it's not going to be hung up maybe in two and a half weeks in February when we have this whole debate all over again. Sure. Okay, so let's switch gears a little bit now. We have the World Economic uh, Forum yes. in Davos. It was touch and go there as to whether or not the president was going to be able to go depending on this government shutdown. Looks like he's going to be able to go, mm -hmm. though the first lady is tapping out it's of this here, trip. Yeah. Um, so what are you going to be looking for? Well, I think, you know, Davos also is going to be a scene of different kind of competing views for what the world should look like. Mm -hmm. President Trump is going to go to Davos with his America First message, which in a lot of ways is a rejection of the globalization and multilateralism that Davos has really always been about. Uh, on the other side of the ledger, you'll see uh, leaders from large emerging market economies economies, uh, like India, where Prime Minister Modi gave the opening address this morning, uh, who have a different view on globalization. Globalization made these countries a lot richer. Mm -hmm. They have a stake in globalization. They want more globalization, but on their own terms, so that they can build their own industries and build their own, uh, build their own, uh, build their own wealth. So mm -hmm. I think what you'll see at Davos is really kind of the two sides of this legacy of who won and who lost from globalization. You'll see both of those stories on the mountain this week. But President Trump, uh, as candidate Trump, campaigned against globalism. He did. He, he, he 
part of his message to the American people was uh, he promised a more inward-looking government, one that focused on American issues, American desires, American exceptionalism, mm -hmm. as opposed to perhaps the broader uh, globalist agenda that uh, was suggested that President Obama had. Yeah, his his uh, when he accepted the, the GOP nomination, his motto was Americanism, not globalism, uh, and so it, and that's why it's so fascinating that he's actually going to Davos. What message will he deliver? Uh, I have to expect that he'll be delivering that message to you know this is the bastion of globalism, right? Okay. Steve Bannon, right back when Steve Bannon and, and and Trump were on good terms. When Steve Bannon was Trump's uh, campaign strategist, he said, we are running against the party of Davos, meaning we are running against globalization, running against globalism. So Trump will take that message with him to Davos this uh, this week. Uh, what I find interesting is that these, the, there's this whole other uh, part of the world, uh, emerging market economies that have gotten really wealthy off of, of globalization, which are going to come with a different message. President Xi Jinping of China addressed Davos last year and said, China is now the new guardian of globalization, right. a very particular kind of globalization. Uh -huh. right? Just ask American firms who are doing business in China how easy it is to, to, to be global firms there these days. But the Chinas and the Indias are trying to claim the mantle of being the new leaders of a new globalization, a new globalism as the U.S. steps back. But I, I, I suspect that it is easier. If you're right. China is one exception. But when you have a major democracy like India saying, look, we are prepared to take on that mantle. And then you have other countries that are closer to us here in the West, France uh, and Germany, that mm -hmm. have also embraced globalism. Perhaps the message to President Trump will be, look, you're not the only game in town anymore. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you and Britain, with the Brexit uh, decision, are now the outliers, and the rest of the world is moving in sync, in concert, towards a, a resolution that benefits at least those people in yeah. those countries. Which should be the predicted outcome for him. Right. But I wonder if that's what he would really want to hear. Well, you know? it's it's been many years that the U.S. wasn't the only game in town now. Right. The difference is that we have a U.S. president who is deliberately pulling the U.S. out of that mm -hmm. game. Right? I mean, U.S. influence and econ relative economic power has been declining for years as the Chinas and the Indias and Southeast Asias grew economically. Um, but the difference is that Trump has come and saying, you know what, not only are we get the, the United States does not see an interest in playing that traditional role as an advocate and guarantor of globalization, mm -hmm. that in fact, from his perspective, it's better for the U.S. to turn away from the world in a lot of, in a lot of uh, respects. By the way, yep. just an aside, something I read in the Washington Post yesterday, the president likes to imitate the accent of Prime Minister Modi, uh, the Indian Prime Minister. Minister. You're kidding that me. was in the reported in the Washington Post. Actually, on a story regarding Afghanistan, but somehow the, it escaped a lot of people's well, attention. That's true. It did not escape the attention of of South Asian journalists here, uh, South Asian American journalists, and Indian journalists in fake India. News, I bet. Totally fake news. I exactly. bet. I bet. All right. So we always love to wrap up with hard numbers. Let's do it. Number one, ninety thousand. Ninety thousand. In all ninety thousand of Turkey's mosques over the weekend, there were conquest prayers in support of the government's intervention in the Syrian civil war. Hmm. Uh, Turkey for decades was a bastion of state-backed secularism. Under President Erdogan, the country has embraced a much more Islamic form of national identity. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. We'll have to see yeah. where that leads because it is it is sort of interesting that for many years it was sort of considered a secular country, uh, part of why it was embraced in Europe and mm -hmm. why Turks were embracing Europe in gen uh, as well. Uh, okay, 390 women. 390 women. That's the number of women who are running for seats in the House of Representatives. Uh, during the midterms. It is the highest number of women who have ever run by a long shot. Mm -hmm. um, Hillary's loss, Trump's victory, the Me Too scandals have galvanized what could be a sea change in political participation for women in this country. A and, good thing. And that's what Time's Up was all about, too. Absolutely. It was about funding, helping to raise money to fund mm -hmm. this sort of thing as well. Um, 97. 97 percent of Brazilians believe their government caters to a small, powerful elite. They're not wrong. Yeah. Uh, 97 percent of Brazilians think that their government is, is catering to a powerful elite. That's the dynamic that will shape the presidential election in Brazil this fall. It's Latin America's largest economy, and an outsider to can outsider candidate is probably going to do very well, at least initially. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah, this that fall. sounds like an upset to me for sure. Yeah. So yeah. one of the we just talked about the women running for Congress uh, here in the United States. Seventy. On the flip side of that, 70 in China. Mm -hmm. You've got 70% of female Chinese university students say they've experienced sexual harassment. In other words, the m movement that has taken hold here in the United States is not as prevalent in other countries. 
Well, uh, or is it because they're clearly coming forward? Well, they're coming well, forward, but only four percent are reporting them to the police. Mm. Only four percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is an issue. I mean, the the if Me Too uh, spreads to China, that would be a, 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 a significant event, right? Right. Because uh, there's two things that would actually come into play there. One is a sort of patriarchal system there, but right. also the Communist Party itself does not want to be uh, the subject of uh, of accusations and allegations about about Me Too. So mm -hmm. if Me Too spreads to the world's uh, largest, by some measures, economy. Uh, spreads to China, we could see some interesting things politically there as well. 40, last number, 40. Uh, in countries with uh, recently ended civil wars, there's a 40% chance of lapsing back into conflict. Yeah. As countries end the civil war, it's 40% chance they can slip back into that civil war right when the civil war ends. That declines year over year. Yeah. Um, but it's just a basic point. Look, when you look at Syria, when you look at what's going on in Syria now, you look at the Colombian attempts to kind of secure a peace after the end of the civil war, Sri Lanka, South Sudan. Yeah. You know, ending a war is hard, securing peace is even harder. Yeah. Um, and that's something we have to bear in mind. We'll see what happens in Syria. That's the next big civil war that needs to first end, and then we'll see if peace can be secured. Yeah, well, Alex Clement, always a pleasure talking to you. So always great. interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thanks, guys. Alex. Pleasure.